Guys, I want to welcome you to another episode of the Advisory Board Podcast, where we bring in experts from the franchise community and business ownership in general to give you some thought leadership, some actionable advice, things that will actually help you to grow. And I've got a friend of mine with me here, uh, the Jerry Akers. If you don't know this guy yet, let me brag on him for a minute. But before I do, um, he's not just a, a good looking face. I'll, I'll just say that. Um, so we've got uh, we, there's there's a, a serious thing a issue coming into the franchising space that isn't being talked about right now. So Jerry's an expert in in helping organizations do succession or next generation planning uh, with franchise ownership. Sixty percent of all franchises right now are owned by boomers. Does that terrify anybody? You thinking yeah. about that in your brand right now? So, so we're going to talk about that strategy and also how to help franchise units to grow, to actually, you know, have a plan in place to get them from a single unit operator to somebody who owns five to ten locations. Uh, now, Jeremy, going to brag on you, and then I'll let you share a little bit yourself. So, uh, just so you guys know, why I've got Jerry here. Uh, he's been in the franchising community for a long time, a couple of decades. So. Uh, he's he's been a 20 year multi state multi unit owner. I forget how many salons you own, but it's a lot, like north of 50, isn't it? Oh, uh, 34. But thank you, Dave. 34 plus joint the joint like the, the joint. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, Jerry Jerry knows what he's talking about, and he has himself lived the path. But but there's there's more. Like he he wrote a he's a co author of a best selling book, uh, live live it to, live it to own it. Man, that was rough to get out. Live it to own it. <laughs> And uh, so you guys can check that. I'm guessing on Amazon, any major platform, they can find that. Yeah. Um, but he's also the founder of Z Dynamics, and he's an avid baseball fan and an Iowa farm boy. I'm an Illinois farm boy, so like we get along great, and a baseball guy. So, uh, Jerry, what did I leave out? Tell us just a little bit more about you, about Z Dynamics, what you're working on now, and then we'll jump right into this topic of sure. How we help people worry about these transitions with the yeah. Next sounds year. good. Thank you, Dave. And and I I think you and I identify with each other so well because of the farm boy and the baseball and all that because. You know, we got work ethic different than everybody else. And and baseball is a methodical game. You got to, you know, go base by base and all those kinds of things. There's no, you know, there are home runs, but they're few and far between. Yeah. So uh, I, I ran the corporate America route like many franchisees do and literally bought my first franchise on a whim. Just what do I have to lose? We'll try it and see if it works. We kept our corporate jobs. Well, it was a struggling acquisition that we had, and we doubled the revenue in the first six months. And uh, then we bought four more that were struggling. And within a couple of years, we had tripled the revenue in those. So we found a path into franchising through using some corporate America stuff to just boom them. And uh, I retired. My kids retired me because I had worked enough after I built that organization uh, for Great Clips. Uh, and that lasted for a week because I'm not a retirement kind of guy. <laughs> so, so uh I had researched the joint and I decided to join that. I'm the regional developer for two states and own five clinics of my own and support two other franchisees who are growing their own enterprise. And then uh, hired a young man to run that, uh, tried to retire again, ended up co-authoring that best-selling book that you mentioned. And uh, then my phone started to ring, Dave. I started to get calls from struggling franchisees. And I live, eat and breathe this stuff. And I want everybody to have what I got. I want them all to be successful and make good money and all those kinds of things. And so these struggling franchisees pulled at my heartstrings. So I started doing some, some coaching with them. Um, they would get successful then their franchise or would call and say, man, can you do this for all of our franchisees? Which led, <laughs> <I'll bet. laughs> which led to me creating Z dynamics with three really brilliant young, young female partners who are way smarter than I am. And they do all the hard work in the background, but um, so now I spend the vast majority of my time doing keynotes and work sessions for franchisors, which generally leads to some one-off executive coaching with franchisees that want to scale and plan for, you know, transition to their second generation, some of those kinds of things. So that might've been a little longer than you expected, but that's really in a nutshell what's going on, Dave. Yeah, no, I, I love it. And it, what, what I find is, uh, consistent with people who love what they do. Yeah. And what they end up doing day to day kind of kind of results from just being excellent at something and people start to take note and then they start to almost create and shape the opportunity for you. Right. It wasn't you saying, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to start this business is like people dragging you in. You're like, OK, let's put some structure around what I'm doing now that I'm passionate about. That's what what a great way to to, to start something. Jerry, tell us. I mean, this is you're the one that told me the statistic, but but why should people be a little bit nervous about the fact that 60% of all franchise owners are boomers right now? 
Well, um, I'm a boomer. I'm a young boomer, which means uh, there's a lot of 75 and 80 year old boomers out there that own franchise systems. And I've helped solve some problems that that creates, Dave, where uh, an 80 year old boomer will pass away unexpectedly and not have a transition plan in place. In fact, in a couple of cases where they haven't even given up the right to sign checks to somebody else, which puts your entire organization in jeopardy. The franchise, or many cases, gets in jeopardy and has to step in and solve some things. It's mm -hmm. a nightmare. And, and I get it. I'm going to work till I die. And those 80-year-old boomer uh, you know, uh, franchisees want to work till they die. But that does not mean that you can't have a strategy in place for something to transition if something would happen with you or over a period of time or whatever. So really, after living through a couple of those where I helped uh, you know, franchise groups out of that situation. It drove me to start doing this. We have transitioned our Great Clips business to the second generation where two of my daughters and a son-in-law run that. And frankly, they're younger, smarter, more tech savvy, uh, closer to the age of our employees. So in many ways, more successful than I am at doing that. And so now I'm trying to spread the word about that because when that happens, it's hard on the franchisee, what's left of the franchisee's system. So in other words, if he owns 10 units, his employees may not get paid the next week because he didn't allow anybody else to sign paychecks. Um, there's a struggle that's in there and it's not necessary. So uh, I like sharing the story about that. I find that franchise systems that are somewhere between 15 and 25 years old, so their original franchisees are still in, but starting to think about you know what the future looks like. The franchisor hasn't thought about it, which compounds the fact the franchisee hasn't thought about it. Yeah. So I'm kind of trying to spread the word uh, to both sides of that. But really, franchisors, in my opinion, should be proactive on this to, you know, uh, plan to have a speaker come in or get something out through their uh, exchange of information, their newsletter, website, whatever it is for the franchisees to start thinking about it. I am not an attorney. I'm not a legal expert. So I, I literally coach them to hire somebody to do that part of it. But as far as the planning even so far as how do you talk to your second generation about maybe doing this someday? Um, my daughter started a second generation company for Great Clips, or not company, a second generation group. And uh, it started out with like five people in it. I think they've got 50 or 60 second generations in it. And these kids talk to each other almost on a daily basis, sharing ideas and problems and thoughts, which boomers don't do. Mm -hmm. So just the fact that you can work your way through that and plan for it, I think, is valuable for both sides of that equation. Yeah. Well, let, let's talk about that for a second, because there's you, you mentioned a little bit of the risk. Right. Um, but there's a, there's a lot. This is multidimensional. Right. So there's and, and this isn't just franchise owners, by the way. This is franchisors. There are some yeah. franchise systems that have franchise owners that are. You know, and 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 I, I, you know, may rest in peace. There are a couple of people recently in this industry that unexpectedly have passed away without having what in corporate America we call the succession plan. Right? People don't talk about that in franchising. I, I haven't heard that word in five and a half years in this industry. But but it's a really serious issue that we've got to make sure we we handle. Um, I think about you know uh, Salty Dog, uh, you know John who passed away took completely unexpectedly. Uh, I think about uh, Strickland Slade's dad passed away completely unexpected. Well, not, he was, he was aged, but he was healthy and active and yeah. relatively quickly. And, and I, and I don't mean any disrespect to these guys at all because they're incredible business people, super hard workers. And yet the, the turmoil that happens without a proper plan in place, even from a franchisor can, can really cause ripples uh, in a franchise system. I know Slade was, you know, fighting with, banks and 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 getting attorneys so he could as the the proper person to run the business uh could actually manage it you know and, and take things over properly and and uh what what a journey he had there but yeah so tell us about the franchisee franchise owners like what so we talk about bank account access and things but what are some of the other things that, that can really get in the way if there isn't a proper plan in place and someone needs to step away from the business quickly well, sure. I mean, you've got reporting and accountability you've got with landlords and with uh, corporate, your franchisor and so on that can't be taken care of. It takes signatures to do a lot of those kinds of things. Um, I I always bring it back to me. It's about the employees to, to a large extent, because, you know, I've got 250 employees in the two in the two brands. Uh, and it's not just 250. It turns into a thousand when you add spouses and kids into that. And they're counting on me to be able to get them a paycheck every week and make sure their benefits are in place and things like that. 
So we can talk about the impact on the franchisee and the impact on the franchisor, which is huge. But you got to think about your employees and what it does to them if they can't get a paycheck for a couple of weeks because you haven't got this set up. So I have seen groups of franchises literally die on the vine and get picked apart by buzzards trying to pick one or two units off simply because the franchisee didn't plan for this. And again, I'm not suggesting they retire or quit or any of those kinds of things. I'm saying have those conversations, get your plans in place so that if something happens to you, you know, you're ready to go. And from the franchisor side, again, I think there's a comfort level they should get by making sure they're, they're, older franchisees in particular, but really any franchisee has a plan in place. Oh, yeah. And I was just thinking through the impact. So uh, let, let's frame it this way. I, I've been operating this business. A lot of these boomers have been running their businesses for 15, 20 years, right? They've right. renewed a few times their con- their franchise agreement. Um, mm-hmm. there, there are legal impacts to even renew or transfer the franchise agreement to somebody else if that hasn't been done beforehand, right? There's costs, there's time, there's there's delay. Uh, but but you mentioned the, the the employees at the location, instability, questioning, like, well, like if, if the payroll company, like the bank accounts get frozen because somebody's deceased, guess what's not coming out of the bank account? Payroll. Yeah, guess right. what's not coming out of the bank account? The lease payment. Guess what's not coming out of the bank account? Oh, your equipment, your equipment, uh, uh, you know, payments and like all your loan payments. And like there, there, there are like, if you just think the financial side of it. Wow. But what, what happens when... Uh, what happens when employees are like, crap, what am I going to do here? And yeah. You start, go ahead. Well, Dave, we can even keep it really simple here. Think about if a, if an owner passes unexpectedly, what are the first thoughts of the employees without getting into whether there's a transition plan in place or any of that? First thought of the employee, what does it do to my job? Should I start looking for another job? Fear. So mm-hmm. in the world of tough staffing, which we all live in today, you don't want any potential negative vibes out there with your your employees. So again, in addition to a second generation or a partner having to piece together the financial part of it and the leases and the corporate relationships and stuff, they may have to rehire half of their employees because they got scared and they left. Yeah. And then you're trying to keep this business running with a skeleton crew instead of your normal crew. I mean, it can be as simple as that, um, but we can talk about the cost and all that. You know, we talked about legal costs. The legal costs to set up uh, a transition, a planned transition, are relatively manageable. Mm -hmm. The legal cost to fight for that transition, if it's not in place before somebody passes, could be 10 or 15 or 20 times what it would take to do it up front. So, I mean, there's so many components to this. It's a ripple type thing that just goes up and down the system and causes all kinds of anxiety and issues that are simply not necessary. If we just have the conversation up front and people make some decisions. No, you're spot on. Yeah, and that that legal cost, I mean, boy, there are a couple of people you could talk to in this industry about what does it cost really sure. to, to get attorneys involved to fight and prove, uh, you know, su- succession, all that kind of stuff. It's crazy. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of like uh, medieval Europe succession battles, uh, you know, seriously. Yeah. Uh, similar costs, I think, relatively. But um, let's talk about the value. I mean, at the end of the day, this is an asset, right? When you own a franchise, and the reason why I love this industry is because we're we're giving people, and especially non-traditional business owners, mm-hmm. business ownership, which is the fastest way to accrue wealth, land and business ownership. There's, yeah. no, there's nothing else. Stock market's not going to do it for you. Day trading's not going to do it for you, right? Those are usually the, the after effects of people who've made it big with land or business ownership. So, but what happens to the value of the asset? when the sole owner operator of this asset is now no longer available. Yeah. You know, uh, if you're selling, if that has to move along to another franchisee that's already in the system and so on, if it's a quick sale, it's probably going to be okay from a valuation standpoint, but if it's to an outside party, part of the reason that was successful is because of you and you're not there anymore, and they don't have the ability to pick your brain and learn what to do and what not to do and those kinds of things. So that does enter into the the validation, the the valuation of that. So you have to keep that in mind. And if it, it, again, the longer it takes to make the transition or to uh, sell it or whatever the case might be, that typically your business is shrinking during that time period because you're not there driving it anymore. And most franchise systems are valued on profit or a multiplier of profit. Yeah. So 
the first thing that's going to be impacted negatively is the profit that you're bringing in, which is going to have a ripple effect anywhere from three to five or 10 times, depending on the multiplier you're using. Mm -hmm. uh, so it just continues to multiply and get tougher and harder. So again, there, and Dave, I'll, I'll look at it from the opposite standpoint, you know, there's no reason. There's literally no reason to not have those discussions. Yeah. You can still do whatever you want to do with the information, but there's no reasons not to start that discussion. And there's all kinds of reasons that you absolutely should be starting them. Let's talk about the role of the franchise or in this, in this situation as well. So, so franchise or is if they're, if they're heads on straight, they're really focused on helping franchise owners Incre increase their profitability, increase their, their AUV, right? Increasing the value of this enterprise that they're building. That's the franchisor's ultimate responsibility. Um, and if you're that franchisor, uh, what, what kind of a role should you be taking in education and planning and in, in helping your franchise owners to think, you know, more than 60 days down the road about something like this? Yeah, I think a big part of that is uh, first the franchisor needs to understand it because most of them haven't even thought about the impact they're going to feel when that happens. And it'll be huge. They, they, they have not quantified it, but it will be huge. So and you described a couple of situations. So, you know, you've lived through it to some extent, too. Um, so my first suggestion to a franchisor is have somebody it doesn't have to be me because there's other people doing this but somebody come in and talk to you about it speak to your franchisees about it tell stories like you and i are telling right now about you know kind of horror stories that happened out there talk about the fact there's no reason not to start that process even if you don't go all the way to the end of the rainbow or whatever so i think the franchisor should facilitate that part of it through some uh, online communication with their franchisees and likely a speaker or a work session or something like that related to what that looks like. I think a franchisor can also find a, a uh, secession attorney out there that they could negotiate and get with and get a, a, you know, kind of a package deal or some kind of a lower rate or something to, uh, to consult with franchisees on this uh, for a very low cost. Uh, I think that's, that stuff is brilliant and it will set the franchisor up for a much smoother transition in everything they're doing, if anything does happen with that. The other thing I will add is um, when somebody passes, the franchisor is going to get a new franchisee, mm -hmm. either somebody in the family, a partner, or an outsider, one of those. In most cases, the franchisor in a real fast pace is going to have to onboard that new franchisee. And, and, and onboarding somebody that's going to run one unit is different than onboarding somebody that's going to run 10 or 20 units. So um, it is you do not want to do that in crunch time. You want to have some time to do that because it's going to impact revenue. Mm -hmm. What do franchisors get, get paid by? Royalties on revenue. So it's going to negatively impact them from that standpoint. They're going to lose a valuable resource in the owner when he passes, he or she passes. And so having a plan for what that looks like, who are we going to work with in that organization moving forward, I think is one of the best things franchisors can do right now to protect their interests, but more importantly, protect the franchisee and their employees and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what, I mean, Jerry, give us an idea. What does it cost? I mean, you know, a lot of people have maybe a living will or something like that. What does it actually cost to legally create a succession plan so that ownership seamlessly transitions to the next generation if, the, if somebody has a, a life event? Well, you can easily spend $10,000 on it or something mm -hmm. like that. But uh, for most franchisees, that is not an insurmountable amount. And you'll be spending it over a period of time. Typically, what happens is you find a, uh, you know, a, some kind of a transition type attorney and they will uh, they'll have an hourly rate and they'll charge you for it. Uh, but up front, it could be somewhere between three to $10,000, depending on the complexity, how many units you have, how big it is, some of uh, who is involved, some of those kinds of things. But I mean... When you run a franchise, a group of franchise units, um, you know, three to ten thousand dollars is not a lot of money. So um, and again, the upfront research with that attorney will be minimal. You might be spending a thousand or fifteen hundred bucks on those first couple of meetings or something like that. And then you'll know what you kind of want to do from that point on. So um, I would suggest it's money well spent. Trust me. Uh, franchisees spend more money than that on a lot of other questionable things. So this is something that will really protect their business long-term. Yeah. And a lot of franchise owners, as they start to build, they get beyond the hustle, they start to see the horizon and realize that they're building a legacy. 
So, you know, there, I think that if you look at the investment of, you know, three to five, three to ten thousand dollars, ten thousand on the high end, right, of of investing and protecting the legacy so the next generation can use this vehicle as a way to continue to build wealth and put kids through college and, and you know, you know, enjoy some of that leisure life activities that they, they've hoped to be able to do seems like a pretty small investment. I mean, you're not even buying a used car at that point. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is too. And and trust me, if you've got a really large organization, you may spend more than that. But the bottom line is we're talking about the average units of the, the average franchisee. And I think easily you can do it in that range. Um, and you talked about the the whole, uh, you know, multiple units and scaling and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's critical that people understand that the, the bigger this is, the harder it is to transition. It's going to take more time. So if you have one unit, it, it's it's tough. If you have 5, 10, 15, 20 units, it gets to be, I mean, it's a corporation, Dave. Yeah. So think about what corporate transitions look like, you know, and most of us don't think about that. As I said, you know, I've defined it as franchise franchise systems that are 15 to 25 years old or older, in many cases, haven't given any thought to it. And it is, from my standpoint, one of the biggest things that's being missed right now in franchising is how that's going to look in the future. I mean, our kids changed the direction of our business. Um, they've made us stronger. Uh, so not just because it protects the business, but in my case, it made my business better by having a strategic way to transition. You get the kids a chance to learn the business. You get a chance to train them so that your expertise isn't gone when you pass. Yeah. Some of that survives on. You give them a chance to make their own name with the franchisor so the franchisor knows who they're going to be working with long-term. And even that part of it transitions over a longer period of time. I mean, really, there are so many positive things that come out of this. And like I said, when I started this, very few franchise systems are even talking about it right now. Yeah, and, and you bring up something really important. So the next generation, right? This, this I think some people, especially boomers, right? Because they've built so much, right? It was a generation of, I'm going to build, I'm going to create, I'm going to go own and and uh, there's still that spirit of entrepreneurship is different now than it was. Uh, at least that's how I perceive. I'm right in the middle uh, of of, sure. of uh, the boomers and and the next gen crew, the Gen Z. And uh, and I see and I, if I, sometimes I feel like I'm an alien, like I don't belong <laughs> uh, because I, I I lean more toward the boomer mindset than the new gen mindset. But that doesn't mean it's bad. Yeah, you said something that I really appreciate though, which is. The, the transition doesn't mean you step aside immediately. That's not what this is about. Frankly, uh, you might be the guy that, you know, that dies at his desk. If that's who you, who you want to be, right? Uh, some people just love the the feeling of accomplishment at work, you know, and and where they might just start working three days a week instead of five or whatever that looks like. If, if you don't start that transition where you've got the knowledge transfer and the, the relationship transfer with the franchise or and, and legal partners and, and business relationships early, uh, then when, if you have to step out unexpectedly, that becomes now really awkward for people because there's no trust, there's no relationship. And, and again, a lot of those things that create value in your enterprise can start to shrivel up a little bit. Well, yeah. And, and even one thing that, you know, if there's any positive things that come out of COVID, it's that we all learned we can do more virtually than we ever have before. So yeah. if, if you want to, if you want to die at your desk, you could die at your, at your figurative desk and be in Florida when your business is in Iowa, yeah. but still staying engaged in your business, still doing all the things you always have done in the past without being inside the four walls. And if like in our case, our kids are boots on the ground, they're running the business, they're the face of it and that kind of stuff. But I'm a phone call away. I can engage in any of the meetings that we have virtually. Uh, I did a meeting this morning with my my joint group because they were uh, having an all in meeting. And I, I, I'm brought in from time to time to do a status of the business type update for our employees. And so you can do that from anywhere. So it allows you to still own and run your business, have a transition in place so that that it's going to be taken care of long term, but also live a little different life than you might have normally if you felt you had to be there. You can travel, you can have a second home, you can retire somewhere else and still be engaged. So to your point, Dave, you don't have to just plan on walking away when you do this, but it, you should look at it more as a gradual thing and you can pick and choose what you stay involved in in the future. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. And I love that thought. And Jerry, I mean, you've lived this now personally, right? Tried to retire oh, yeah. twice, but you've transitioned to the next generation. And you said something that I want to come back to, which is it made the business better. Mm -hmm. So remember that 
you know, boomers are retiring and passing away, sadly, because I, I love the generation. But but that means as, as a purchasing class, they're also graduating and, you know, passing on and not consuming as much as they did of, of maybe the service that you're running. So at some point, there's a real strength and power to transitioning in the next generation to help lead and drive the business because they're connected to the people who are you're now your target buyers. Absolutely. You know, you got you got the customer side, you got the employee side. And my I'll use our group. Our kids are closer to the age of both of those. Mm -hmm. uh, they're the way that they purchase things. Their mindset is more in line with our current customers than our past customers and those kinds of things. So from that standpoint, it's good. And I'll use one example. Uh, I talked to you about them being smarter than I am and those kinds of things. I mean, you touched on it, Dave. You know, when we built our business, it was just bootstrapping it. It was I was in there painting walls when we remodeled or when we started a new one, you know, helping lay flooring or um, hanging units on the wall or whatever the case might be. That's the way we built it. Our kids are wired differently. They're building it with better technology and with better relationships up and down the board and those kinds of things. Just the other day. We wanted to do a, uh, a forecast for next year for uh, for one of our businesses. And my son-in-law is brilliant at that. So he took all the information, the history and all that kind of stuff. And he put together a multi-page, very engaging, very informative uh, explanation for us, a, a, a spreadsheet. And I can't do that, Dave. I'll be very honest with you. I do not. I, I, I have trouble with my phone sometimes, you know, Uh <laughs> Let me go out and talk to my employees. Let me do marketing. Let me do all those kinds of things. I'm great. But put a phone in my hand or a computer and somebody else better set it up because I can type, but I don't want to get into all the other stuff. Now you put one of these younger people in their 30s or 40s or something like that in there. Man, that's they've grown up with that. So they can make it, you know, all kinds of things I can never do, which, by the way, makes it much easier for me to manage my business because I've got better data, better information and somebody to explain it to me. So. Yeah. It is a very positive thing, bringing that in a generation up to another level earlier rather than later. Yeah, I want to share another example. I'm going to ask you a question. It's very leading, but I think you'll know where I'm going with it. What, what are some of the, the highest lead producing channels for you today that you didn't have when you first started the business? <laughs> well, uh, social media and digital, that's bottom line. Uh, in fact, uh, being an old marketing guy and sales guy, you know, I'm still billboards and TV and radio and things like that, you know, newspaper, believe it or not. Uh, but we don't do hardly any of that anymore because, again, we've transitioned to those kinds of things. And that's I, I like getting reports explaining it, but I, I don't want to manage it. So yeah. these kids grew up with that. They understand it. They can go get a tutorial right straight from the providers on how to make it effective and so on, or they can go to YouTube and get an explanation or whatever, uh, or the franchise or does some classes, but they are brilliant at that kind of stuff. And I'm not. So turning things over to them actually helps grow my business much quicker because we're getting in front of the right people at the right time in the way that they absorb information. Yeah. Spot on. Okay. Yeah, no, that's it, it's something I've observed. And yet, like, I'm just getting to that age now. I've got a 20 year old, a 19 year old and twins that are 16 in my house, 16 and a half. So, uh, you know, I've been coaching baseball for years. I don't do that anymore, but I'm playing now. Uh, but I'm hanging out with these younger folks. And so like, I feel like I'm, on, I'm an outsider looking in sort of understanding almost scientifically, like, what do they like? But it's very different. Like if I tried to get on like uh, Instagram and, and try to engage like young people, my voice would be wrong. My voice would be wrong. Even sure. though I'm really connected to the generation, I wouldn't be speaking to them the way that they want to be spoken to. And they can, they perceive me as an outsider because of that. So there's a lack of trust and they're not going to be motivated to buy. Right. Yeah. It's, I mean, even more so with you, cause you're another generation removed from them. And frankly, most folks, I think in that generation, like my dad, but they're just like, I don't even want to engage in that channel. I don't want an Instagram account. I don't want to get on Facebook. No. Like it's just a, a, a hotbed of, of divisiveness and craziness. And, and I can only see so many baby pictures before I'm done for the day. Right. So like, <laughs> like there's just that, that mindset shift, but guess where everybody's at the key buyers. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. So love that you shared that. Yeah. And it moves every day, Dave, because there's so many platforms out there and one's hot for a while. And then another one's hot for a while. And I have not only very little interest in them, but certainly don't want to try and track the ebbs and flows of that. So having people that, that 
live on those platforms and understand them to actually use them to our benefit is it's a gold mine. It, it just moves the needle so much better than anything we've done in the past that, that, you know, there's so many benefits to this transitional thing, Dave, that's what we're getting at. Right. right. We can talk about protecting your business. That's what I think is the, is the big elephant in the closet. What right. happens if you pass? Yeah. But I mean, when you start looking at all of these subsequent benefits that come out of it, the list is like 20 or 30 or 40 units long, you know, different bullet points on there. Yeah. So there, there is so much power in having those conversations and starting that. And I, that's the number one subject I get asked to come in and talk at conventions about is our journey through that, what my daughters are doing to build our business, my son-in-law, and how others should be looking at that as a positive thing, not a negative thing. Mm -hmm. And then number two is scaling because younger brands have a lot of franchisees that own one or two units. They should by now own three or four or five units. So um, I get called to come in and talk about how we scaled and the benefits of that and how you don't work 10 times harder with 10 units than you did with one unit. It's just mm -hmm. not, not that way. So mm -hmm. those are the kinds of things I'm pushing right now because uh, they're being overlooked in franchising and they're low hanging fruit for franchisors and franchisees to both perform at a higher level, have more profits, get more comfortable, add more units if you're a franchisor so the franchisor can scale faster. I mean, there's, again, just like the first subject, there's so many benefits and almost nothing negative that comes out of that. So, you know, this new new business was kind of sprung on me, but it's really to try and help franchising as a, as a, as a great model that, you know, provides, you know, generational wealth and legacy and all those other kinds of things. Yeah, I love it. Well, let's shift into that. That's kind of the secondary topic today, which is, okay, franchisors, so many of them are laser focused on unit growth. They're trying they're, 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 they're trying to grow the number of units, not unit, not unit performance necessarily, uh, although hopefully they focus on both, but they're trying to sell more units. And, uh, and, I th and many times they're overlooking the most valuable resource to them to not only purchase additional units and territories, but operate them successfully, which is their existing franchise owners. So what? how do you... Jerry, coach franchise brands to systematize that flow. Not just they, they first have to recognize that it's actually a gold mine and it's the best place and best way, right? But how do you, how do you help coach them to build a process to mature franchise owners to be successful to a point with a single unit and then be successful with multiple units? Yeah, so quite a bit of that is education, Dave. You know, um, when you buy your first unit you're going to go through some pain that you didn't expect. So making sure that we're selling them correctly for the first unit, I think is one of the keys that they need to understand because the more pain you go through building your first one, the less likely you are to build the second one. So making sure that goes much smoother. Uh, and that's something that you can facilitate by the support that you give to your franchisees. Um, then helping them understand what I just said. Owning 10 is not 10 times more difficult than owning one. There's a lot of benefits in, in doing that. So furthering the education, you know, understanding you're not putting that much more time into it. You've got, you've built, you're building infrastructure with maybe a one or two mid-level managers or something like that, that are doing a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff. So you don't have to, um, you, your, your overhead goes down percentage wise per unit. Yeah. That's business 101, right? So margin uh, goes up, right? Margins yeah. go up, right? Yeah. And, uh, one thing nobody thinks about very often is you can leverage your staff too, because uh, two in two ways. Number one, most staff wants the opportunity to grow in their job. So in other words, they want to be an assistant manager, a manager, area manager, something someday. So when you have one unit, you've got limited ways that that person can go and they may leave you for opportunities. Maybe your best employee leaves you for opportunities. If you start scaling, you're going to be opening, let's say, one or two units a year for some time period, whatever that is. You, A, have lots more opportunities come up, which you advertise to your employees. I'm a big proponent of, in fact, we do this, uh, having a management training program. Even if that person's never going to be a manager, get them into it because they become a better employee. And if, if they do become somebody you want as a manager, if somebody quits, you fire them or you open another unit, you got somebody to step right in. So, I mean leveraging your employees you can hire from different areas you can ask an employee in one unit to fill in another unit if somebody doesn't show up for work one day so you can stay effective in two units where one of them might shrink if uh, 
you know, you're having trouble staffing it. There are just so many ways to leverage staff in a positive way and give them opportunities when you scale. So all of this comes back to the franchise or understanding the franchisee side of it and be able to position that with your franchisees in, you know, again, keynotes or work sessions or introducing them to the subject so that they start thinking that way. What I see quite often is um, the fear of what we went through on the first one keeps people from buying the second one. When you can take that fear away through the stuff we just talked about, they're the first one that wants to buy another one. Now, from the franchisor standpoint, you want to go out and find a brand new franchisee that you've got to onboard and educate and deal with all kinds of new franchisee headaches. Uh Or do you want to expedite and simplify the process for somebody to buy their second and third and fourth unit? I think to me, that's common sense, but many, especially uh, I would say zero to 10 year uh, old franchise systems, they really haven't got to the point where they're even thinking about that right now, at least not in great detail. They might dream about somebody buying a whole bunch of them and maybe have a sales process, but not really an educational process. Yeah. And that's, I think that's the part that I see missing the most is the education process. And where does it begin, right? If, if you want a, a somebody who's buying a franchise from you to really think seriously about being a multi-unit owner, at what point should you be discussing multi-unit ownership potential with that with that franchise owner? I'm a proponent of on day one. In other words, when you're talking to them about their first unit, yeah. you know, um, you know, Dave, Dave, I'm big about responsible franchising, and I think um, there's not as much bad stuff going on out there as the perception is, but there's certainly some things that could be fixed, adjusted, cleaned up a little bit. The the term semi absentee ownership leads to a sale but it leads to a lot of angst and anxiety and things like that down the road, which leads to people not buy, failing or not buying their second and third unit, right? Mm-hmm. So being a sales guy, I know it's a little more work to not use the term semi-absentee ownership, but mm-hmm. you'll probably still get the sale if you just do a better sales job uh, because the people are talking to you because they want to buy. That's better than most sales positions. Um, so, so figuring out that part of it, because when you come from the standpoint that scalability is where semi-absentee ownership lives, mm-hmm. not your first unit, but yeah. depending on the brand and profitability, mm-hmm. your second, third, fifth, eighth unit, whatever that looks like, if you can sell that dream and vision, that's where the magic lies, both as a salesperson and as a franchise or in a franchisee, because you have the chance over a period of time to sell multiple units instead of just one. I mean, you're kind of, kind of forcing somebody in some ways into buying that first one through the language that you use and so on. And if you change your mindset, change the way you present it and so on and paint a picture of scalability and what that looks like owning a second home in a, in a nice climate, being able to semi retire at 45 years old, uh, allowing your kids to have a legacy business to get into some of those kinds of things yeah. in that, that first thing you get franchisees who are entrepreneurs and dreamers by nature to dream bigger and to look at a bigger picture rather than what they started with just owning one unit. And then you start this educational process to make their, their, their performance in their first one, you know, higher than it might've been if they were out floundering on their own. And that leads them to say, listen, next year I want to open another one. And in three years, I want to open two or three more. And then, man, I'll tell you, everybody in that system makes more money. They're happier. And it really, it really reinforces the value and the legacy of franchising overall. Yeah. And it all starts at the beginning, right? Setting expectations early on, painting the vision, but then having a plan. Yep. If you have a proper plan as a franchisor, you know, it's, it's been six months and, and the franchisees following the playbook that the part you should, this should be a continual point of discussion. There should be additional training. There should be, you know, you can have coaching mentoring set up in these organizations. Yep. I've talked to a few people who I think are thinking about this, right? And uh, and that's what it takes if you want to have a kind of a, a, a workflow that gets people more and like if you want to increase the number of multi-unit mm-hmm. owners that are successful, not just snow, right? Not just, hey, I've sold five units to Bob and he thinks he's going to be a semi-absentee owner and yet he's floundering with the first one. Now he's got an open schedule he's not going to be able to keep with the next four locations. Like it's not that. That's not the goal. The goal is help Bob succeed in territory one and then sell him two or three units, right? Yeah. And in fact, I'll go to the other side of the equation to reinforce it. The number one reason I'm called to do executive coaching with franchisees is because they were sold a package of one, excuse me, of three or five or something up front. 
So the, the Fran Def people can brag and be excited. The franchisor might be kind of excited because they got a bunch of units sold, but not open. Mm -hmm. And yet there's no support for this person that bought that package in their first one to be successful and their second one to be successful. So they never open the rest of them and probably leave the system or struggle in the system. So if we're going to do that, there's got to be other components. And I think that's support and education for franchisees. And what I know for a fact is that many franchisors, especially in the first two hundred units, let's say their revenue stream is still not where it needs to be to add all of the support pieces for the franchisees to pay for a VP of education and operations and real estate and all those kinds of things. But there are, uh, there are other ways to do that, whether it's through a third party for pennies on the dollar. Fractional is a big word we hear all the time now. So there's, there's no reason not to provide it, except you haven't decided to provide it and gone to the, the uh, effort of trying to figure out what that looks like. Yep. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It all boils down to conscientious effort and planning. And these are, I, I'm grateful, Jerry, that you uh, you and I had that fun conversation that kind of made us both realize we need to talk about this a little bit in a more formal formal way. Um, what, what would you say are, like, from our conversation today, any franchisor that's listening, what, what should they be doing now differently uh, because of hearing what you had to say? What are two or three things you'd like, guys, these are the behaviors you should change today? Yeah. So number one, think bigger. Don't don't think small incremental units. Think bigger. What does that look like for you and the franchisee? Second would be add the structure or the education. If you can't afford the structure, add the education so they can find it somewhere else. Add those pieces to your uh, conversation with your franchisees uh, through, you know, any resource you've got. Certainly conventions and so on are one of the biggest things. And number three, recognize that we're all in this together. And, and really form a relationship with your franchisees. And I get it. I get it. Franchisees are a pain in the backside too sometimes. So it's not just, it's got to be two-sided. But generally, it's got to start with the franchisor saying, hey, we can do better. What does that look like? Maybe form an advisory committee with some corporate and some franchisees that are struggling to figure out what the needs are and what fits the franchise agreement because the expectations of the franchisee might be outside of that. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be able to get that done. So again, this all comes back to making some conscious decisions at the franchisor level and then putting plans in place to make it happen. Even if you don't have lots of cash to you know throw at it, there are ways you can get it done. And brainstorming with somebody that's looked at some of those different ways is one of the easiest ways to start the process. Yeah, love it. Love it. Great advice. So Jerry, let's say somebody heard, heard this uh, or listened to this uh, this podcast and they said, man, I got to talk to Jerry. What's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Probably an email, jerry at zdynamics.com, Z-D-Y-N-A-M-I-X dot com. And, and uh, the letters, yeah. right? The letters, yep. Z Dynamics. Yep. Yep. Love so Jerry. love to talk to anybody. Just a one-off conversation and uh, feel free to get a hold of me anytime you want to. Yeah, you're a good man. Thanks for sharing so much with us, Jerry. It's always a pleasure. And uh, yeah, enjoy, enjoy continuing to grow this empire you're building. Appreciate Good. it. Good. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, you're welcome. Hold on for one second, my friend.